So, Adrian and I began at Leichhardt Uniting Church in January 2019. So, this is the beginning of our fourth year at Leichhardt. It has been a miraculous, joyful three years, with immense growth and individual transformations happening all over the place. But we can honestly say that none of the great things that have happened could have happened without the groundwork that was laid by Reverend Dr. John Hurt who brought a faith community here from Ultimo in 2009 to plant and revitalize this congregation. He and that group embedded a culture of theological rigor, LGBTIQA plus affirmation, active commitments to justice, and a high emphasis on community. Adrian and I inherited uh, all of that when we came as ministers to luck. And our work has simply been building on that initial great work. One of the things that we inherited from John back then is the Luck Liturgy, a set pattern for our Sunday services with repeat, repeated prayers and responses, some that, were ch that change season to season and some remaining constant no matter what. Over the last three years, I have worked on creating new or refreshing existing prayers and responses for seasons and preaching series. You may have noticed that. But I have left some elements of worship completely be, including the wording around lighting the Christ candle, the benediction, and the sermon response. And so we are bound to God's word, and to God's word we are bound. Somehow I felt that these were more immovable parts of the liturgy, not in a bad way, but with a really strong sense of tradition and deep meaning. So I've never touched them. I am aware, though, that over the years, mainly before Adrian and my time, some people have expressed some uncomfortability with the specific wording in the sermon response. And my guess is that there are two sticking points. The first is the use of the word bound, which may feel incongruous with where the spirit of the Lord, there is freedom or liberty and the sense that the whole Jesus thing is about unbinding and unshackling and liberating and freeing. So why would we use the word bound? I also wonder whether the word bound may have connotations for, say, trans people and their bodies or within a conservative view of marriage that sees particularly the woman as being bound to the man in submission and obedience. And I imagine the second sticking point is the use of God's word, which in many, many church spaces is a phrase used interchangeably with the Bible. So are we saying that we are bound to the Bible? And if we are saying that, does that not make an idol of the Bible. Now, those who have been part of the congregation for more than a couple of years and or who have done Wine and Cheeses, our little Faith 101 course, would uh, know and would have heard us talk about the Bible as bearing witness to the Word of God, the Word of God ultimately being Jesus, the person of Jesus. But for new people or visitors to our community, that may not be a concept or something that they have heard before. So, I think to unlock this part of the Luck Liturgy this week, we all need to take a step back and ask some foundational questions. Questions like, what is the purpose of a sermon in worship? Why do we hear from Scripture every worship service? And only then, what is the purpose of verbal responses to each of those moments in worship? I want to start with the second question. What is the purpose of hearing from the Bible in a, in a, each week in corporate worship in the church? Is it even necessary to worship? Let's talk about what we're talking about, shall we? Paraphrasing the wonderful Daniel Migliore in his book, Faith Seeking Understanding, the Bible is a collection of books, stories, poetry, history, allegory, and more that collectively bear witness to the Word of God which was made perfect or which, which was culminated in the incarnation, life, ministry, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ. 
Jesus is the living, breathing, enfleshed word of God. The Bible points to that truth in the same way that prayer points to that truth and music points to that truth and indeed preaching points to that truth. The Bible sets forth Christ. Now, thanks to the printing press and the work of translators over the years, the Bible is readily accessible to all of us in a myriad of different versions and languages. So, why do we hear it from in corporate worship when we all, generally, have the capacity to read it ourselves, on our own, whenever we choose to? For me, it's a weekly reminder that our faith is not just individual or personal, but it is a, it is a collective faith and part of a much broader body of Christ, a body of Christ that spans space and spans time. So, when we all gather and we hear from Scripture every week, we are re-grounding ourselves, or just grounding ourselves, into the story of God that brings us all to church, that calls us to commitment, the story of God that we then weave our own stories into. In, in the same way that there is something really profound about a community of people singing and harmonising to, I don't know, amazing grace or something, there is something really profound about a community of people hearing an excerpt from our holy book together at the same time, face to face and online. That's a really profound thing. And remember, as Adrian said last week, that we go to the word part of the service after we have confessed the ways that we have not lived up to our high calling as disciples and then hearing God's assurance of forgiveness. So our patterns of destruction, self-destruction and destruction in general, become redemptively transformed in this weekly act of the prayer of confession and the receiving of forgiveness. In that moment in the service, we celebrate the freedom of knowing that the things that are ultimately good in life do not finally depend on us, but on the grace of God alone. We speak the language of a world that transcends self-interest and self-reliance and selfishness by using words like we and forgive us and thanks be to God. And it is only from that part of the service that we journey together then to the Bible to hear anew a specific witness to the word of God, that is Jesus, chosen for this community at this time. And our response to hearing from the scriptures is some form of thanks to God for God's word in scripture bearing witness to Christ. It's worth noting too that the Bible readings and the sermon in luck happen right in the middle of the service of worship not at the end, like some other traditions, where everything before the sermon in those traditions kind of leads up to the sermon and then the service finishes soon after. In our tradition, we see the word part of the sermon, part of the service, as like the peak of the mountain, both in terms of importance and significance. It's sort of like the main course of the meal, but also because the elements that come before the word part lead towards it and the elements that come after the word part flow out from it. So we come to worship primarily to be nourished by the word in our discipleship journeys and we prepare to be nourished by singing songs of praise and praying our prayers of forgiveness and, you know, confession and we hear the word and we are nourished by the word and then we respond to the nourishment with our offerings of money, with prayers for others, with communion and being sent out to be disciples in the world. That's how the, the shape of worship is for us. So, we've confessed and we've been reminded of God's abundant grace and, then, and we have listened to a reading or readings from the Bible. Then comes the sermon. What even is a sermon, do you think? My own sense is that the purpose of a sermon, any and every sermon, is discipleship formation, 
Or at least that's the thing that really drives me when I preach. The sermon seeks to bring you to a fuller awareness of the glory of God and the call upon your lives. So if a sermon ever tries to answer a question, the question should be, how then shall we live? Having been reminded of God's grace and having heard something of God's story in Scripture, what are you going to do about it? How then shall we live? What are we going to be in response? Ideally, every sermon should both comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Be a, both a warm hug and a kick up the ass. That's an Adrian quote, apparently. Depending on what is needed at that time. A sermon is not interested in a kind of a call out of our crappy behaviour. It's much more interested in calling in, speaking the truth in love to enable us to grow and change. And yes, the goal of sermons is conversion, not in an altar call kind of a way, but in a a transformational reorienting towards Jesus kind of a way. My hope is that each week through the sermon, but through other parts of worship, you are reconverted and transformed to the way of Jesus or back to the way of Jesus. Now, therefore, a sermon is necessary for us as disciples because if Scripture, if, if scripture is the word of God only in a derivative sense, it does not hold the power to do hermeneutics by itself. That is, Bible passages cannot be taken at face value, read literally, with only one way to understand them. So, a sermon brings an ancient text to a present context by unpacking the text itself and its context and then inviting the community to consider its implications for us today. It's only by proclaiming the word of God in this way that the Bible remains a living, breathing, relevant text for all of us. The other thing is that the sermon is one of the most powerful ways that the community binds itself together by being addressed all at once under the banner of Jesus. And this happens not statically, like a photograph, but really dynamically. In worship, we are bound together in community while headed forward towards the kingdom of God. That's a pretty heavy responsibility to put on the sermon and on the preacher. And that is why not everyone does the work of preaching. It's not a power trip, I swear. This is recognising a simple truth that all of us are called to preach the gospel and some of us are called to preach sermons. All of us are called to preach the gospel, some of us are called to preach sermons. Remember that when you take a stand for a more humane treatment of refugees or welcome new people to Leichhardt or teach children or provide hospitality or visit the sick, you are preaching the gospel. The whole church proclaims the gospel and the preaching of sermons is just one part of that larger ministry. So I am called to the pulpit to preach by virtue of my ordination and you calling me to be one of your ministers. That's why I'm here. Others, including the many who preached last year, are called by virtue of me and Leichhardt Uniting Church seeing gifts in said specific people and encouraging them to use those gifts um, in this way. All of those people who preached last year crushed it because they responded to the calling to preach humbly but passionately. They were authentic, accessible, engaging and captivating. They knew and they loved all of you and they crafted the sermon from that knowledge and love for you all. I may have taught them some things in the Preaching 101 course, but you all formed them. You made those preachers. You built them up into the preachers that they became. 
Each week, this community commissions the preacher to come from within the gathered community, to come from within the congregation up to the pulpit to address you with a specific word for a specific time. So what's your role then? If you're not the preacher, what's your role in the events of hearing from the scriptures and hearing a sermon? Your role is about as far from passive as possible. Let me emphasise that. Preaching and the community of faith are not the same as performer and audience. Instead, they are reciprocal realities in kind of an intimate relationship. The preacher comes from within you, stands before you, and preaches knowing who you are, what your stories are, where you need comfort and where you need affliction. And that, for me, is why guest preaching is generally weaker since they don't have the knowledge of who is before them when they preach. They don't have the knowledge of what the stories are in that community. The relationship between me and you, preacher and you, is so close that you who hear and believe the witness to Christ in scripture and preaching are kind of summoned and ignited to bear witness to that same Jesus with your whole lives in response to tell it, to teach it, and to celebrate it. And so actively listening in a sermon should uh, inspire and challenge you to preach the gospel yourselves, individually, yes, and collectively. So preaching is not a one-way activity. We do this thing together, friends. Preaching is the faithful action of the whole church. And so, the scripture response, the verbal response, and the sermon response, these are simply one way to participate in the events of scripture reading and the sermon. You kind of do so actively, verbally, and consciously. And the words we've had up to each week up until now are really profound. Think about them again. And so, we are bound to God's word. In that, in those, I don't know, however many words they are, it's a statement of prayer, it's a statement of commitment, it is a statement of thanksgiving, and it's a statement of orientation. In and so we are bound to God's word, it's all of those things. However, with all of this information in mind that we've heard today, I think it's important to keep those elements of luck worship But friends, I want to suggest a revised mode for these. I want to try where the scripture response and the sermon response are like part A and part B, or verse 1 and verse 2, with really related wording for these responses to remind us of the relationship between the two, between scripture and preaching, and then encouraging us to be active participants, not a passive audience. And I want to refresh these two responses again, season to season, like other parts of worship. So, for example, a scripture response could be, for the gift of scripture bearing witness to Christ, the living word, thanks be to God. And then the corresponding sermon response could be, we give thanks for Christ, the living word, may we choose the way of Christ with our whole lives. Do you see how they're much more connected? Or a scripture response could be, may Christ open us to the scriptures and set our hearts burning within us, as we said this morning. And then a corresponding sermon response could be, our hearts the altar, your love, O Lord, the flame. I'm really keen to hear your responses to this idea. So comment in the feed or email me or message me with your thoughts. I'm really keen to hear how you feel. But here's the point, my friends. Every single word of every element of the luck worship service seeks to form each of you and all of us together as disciples of Jesus with a healthy theological rigor, a love for all of God's creation and a passion for preaching the gospel. The sermon response is in no way an exception to this. 
And I hope that if we relate the sermon response to the scripture response, we will be reminded each week that Jesus is the living, breathing, embodied word of God. And that all of us are called to preach the gospel. We really are. And that you are as much a part of the sermon event as the preacher and Jesus is. Amen.